good enemy is better than a bad friend. Hey, I am Chuck the Bureaucrat, and in a recent video, I showed you how to go about making allies. And you remember, an ally is somebody who contributes to your internal stability, because that helps their internal stability. And of course, an adversary is anybody who benefits from destabilizing you. Well, making allies is an obvious goal. Creating adversaries and doing it the right way, it's worth knowing how to do that too. First, let's be clear about why an adversary is beneficial. And to do that, you have to remember that strategy really comes down to understanding where people draw the line between us and them. And everybody is drawing their own lines the way they see fit. So what can happen is you can end up with this incredibly muddied no man's land of boundaries. A good adversary helps clearly define that boundary. They build their own coherent coalitions and they articulate their alternative view in a way that is easily understood. At first glance, that might seem like the very last thing you want, but remember that our goal is to influence the distribution of resources, and some decision maker has to make some decision. So clearly delineated lines makes it much easier to move towards that decision. So how do you make a good adversary? Well, it all starts with picking a good adversary. Throughout this process, what you're going to want to do is be able to engage them with respect, even friendliness if possible. And so what you're looking for is someone that you can separate the person from the position, and more importantly, someone who can separate themselves from their position. Now, it helps if your adversary is a genuinely good human being, and I have seen people who use that as their primary criteria for selecting an adversary, but I prefer to pick my adversaries based off of the authorities and responsibilities of their position. In most cases, if there's going to be a contentious issue, it's going to have law, policy, or guidance at its heart. And the conflict will usually be that the existing policy is written in a way that conflicts with organizational objectives. So if you're going into a fight over policy, someone is responsible for that policy. Not only does that person make a natural adversary, but that situation makes it much easier to separate the person from the policy so that you can maintain a professional relationship with the person. Next, and I know this is going to sound funny, you invite your adversary to your meetings. In fact, you probably want your adversary close to the head of the table. Look, if they're the person in charge of the policy that you're trying to change, they're going to get involved eventually. So you want to manage that process. And having them in the room and close to the head of the table, it gives you a couple of advantages. First, you'll move almost immediately to the point of contention, and that way you don't waste hours and hours in a meeting room full of people who agree with you and you're just listening to the echo chamber. Second, you want the responsible authority leading the opposition. Listen, there are going to be any number of people who disagree with you for all kinds of reasons, but you don't want to be negotiating with them individually when they're not even the right adversary. You want your hand-picked adversary dealing with those negotiations inside their coalition. The third reason you want your adversary at your meetings is because their adversaries are your ready-made allies. In fact, there's some people who are going to line up to support you simply because of who you've lined up against. Now, I want to wrap up by giving you a caution. Obviously, you don't want to create too many adversaries and you don't want to do it too fast. I mean, if you just keep making more and more adversaries, it starts to look like you're the problem. But aside from that, there's a mistake you want to avoid in a meeting. And that is, you don't want to create two adversaries at once. Suppose you're sitting at the table and person A says something that you disagree with, and then almost immediately person B says something unrelated that you also disagree with. And then when you get a chance to talk, 
you don't want to say, I disagree with A, but I also disagree with B. That creates an instant coalition between A and B when they might not have had any reason to collaborate to begin with. Objecting to both A and B at the same time also can lead other people at the table to think that you think there's a logical connection between what both of them have said. And so the people at the table assume you are about to refute some sort of complex logic between A and B. And when you don't, because there isn't one, the people at the table assume that you've lost your point and it adds credibility to both A and B. Then you pick off the other point at a later time or you let somebody else handle that one. Look, a lot of people don't like the friction and the competition that goes on at the Pentagon, but to be honest, that's kind of why we're there. So take control of that competition and see how fast your reputation and power grows. And now, you want to make your boss shine? Watch this video to see how to write awesome talking points.